your members said not a jot or a tittle will pass from the law until all is accomplished. And uh, really, it's reasonable uh, to think of the jot or tittle almost as an apostrophe. I think it probably it's more like uh, this is the, uh, I think this is the, uh, in fact, I know this is the word for uh, God, Elohim. Uh, oh, I'm doing it. It should go that way. I'm doing it the other way. But uh, this, you know, would be the tittle. And, uh, uh, this would be the, the jot, you know. Uh, this is the letter in Hebrew for a long I, uh, not a short I, which would be that. But uh, this is a dot and just a little, almost an apostrophe. So Jesus said, not a jot or a tittle will pass from the law until all is accomplished. And I to think that you have to, as a biblical scholar, take that seriously, and that every word is important, and every word is intended by God that he has had written in the Bible. And I think when you take it that way, then you do receive real food from it. If you uh, take it, uh, that's why I think it's you have to be careful about modern translations, because many of them are just paraphrases, and they don't treasure each word uh, in the same way that, say, the Revised Standard or the American Standard uh, or the New Revised Standard or the King James do, you know, where every, every word is precious. Many of the paraphrases kind of get the sense of it. And I think what Jesus was implying was every word that is here is intended by my Father for you to study carefully because it will enable you to keep the right balance and the right perspective in your own life and your own faith. So that's why I think it's important to take such care over the words of Scripture. And that's what we're going to do today with uh, the next verse in Ephesians. And it's important, therefore, to take seriously uh, the next verse, even though, as you can see, it's simply the... Uh, I suppose a subordinate adjective of clause, really. So it's not even a main, it's not even a principal clause, it's just a subordinate clause. And uh, it's uh, Ephesians 1 and verse 8, which he lavished upon us. The previous clause, the previous phrase we dealt with, you remember <coughs> last Sunday uh, at communion, according to the riches of his grace, and then this verse is, which he lavished upon us. And why I emphasized the importance of taking each word seriously is because that word lavished uh, is actually, uh, I'll do it in just the English transliter transliteration, it looks really like uh, that, eperuse. And that's the word lavished. And the word uh, uh, riches is in transliteration, transliterated uh, uh, English letters, is riches. And it's actually, I think, uh, I think the Joanne mentioned it in our prayers, and so often God just, you know, guides us to know what he's going to tell us in that way. Uh, and uh, Keratos, of course, is grace. I'm sorry, that's, that's C-H-A-R-I-T-O-S. Keratos is grace. And every one of them, you know, emphasizes God's rich grace and generosity to us. Uh, the meaning of uh, Plutos is riches, wealth, an abundance of, a great amount of, an extreme value of something. And so uh, the Bible is saying, according to the riches, the amazing abundance, the great amount of, and then grace, a quality that adds delight or pleasure, graciousness, attractiveness, charm, <coughs> goodwill, favor, God's attitude towards human beings of kindness, grace, favor, helpfulness and the exceptional effects produced by God's favor, ability, and power, and enablement. So it's all, you know, the, the uh, extreme abundance of God's complete provision, 
which he has lavished, and lavished, of course, provide for an abundance, cause to increase, cause to abound. So the whole emphasis is, you know, that God has given us more than we need, far more than we need. And that's what the verse is saying. We are the recipients of the riches of God's grace, which he has abundantly lavished upon us and does lavish upon us day after day. <coughs> so, really, just briefly, I'd like to remind you, you know, of that grace, because I think it's overwhelming as you begin to think of it. First, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be here if he hadn't made us. First, his grace in making us. I mean, we can't, we can't imagine what, a, what is it like not to have consciousness. You obviously can't imagine what that is like. But our very existence here, we would not have this if it were not for God. And then he did not do what we would do, you know. We're such controllers. If we make anything, we like to make something that we can control and that is, uh, has not all the advantages that we have. And he didn't do that. He gave us his own life. And who here would have questioned him if he had made us just a little one up on a little dog, one up on a little cat? But he didn't do that. He gave us his very own life. So we have the ability to think like he thinks and to feel like he feels. We have the ability to understand the things that he understands. I mean, it's unbelievable. You could not imagine a God doing that, making other beings that had the same abilities as himself and had his very own life. He did not make us little playthings that he could play with, about with. And indeed, that's where he, he got himself into all this commitment. Because once you make beings like God, they have to be dealt with in the same integrity as God himself deals with himself. Now, I don't know if you've really thought through that. That God is not able to make a group of free will agents and let them tear the whole place apart and then just blot it out and forget it. I think it takes you to think through that a little because I think st st we, with our more casual attitude, tend to think, well, now wait a minute. He made us, okay, we turned out bad, well, he could just wipe us off the face of the universe and start again. He cannot do that. Why? Because of his own integrity. When he commits himself to some line of action, he is bound by his own integrity to stand by that and follow it right out to the end. Now, I think we have trouble with that, you know, because we think, yeah, big deal. So you mess it up. Okay, you wipe it out. You go again. You're the God of the universe. You can do what you want. Yes, unless you were God and are the kind of person he is, who is, has no shadow of turning or no shadow of change within him. And so when he made beings like himself, he was committing himself to all that they would choose to do, and to dealing with that, not pretending that it simply didn't exist. God cannot allow Hitler to exterminate millions without him being each one of those millions. And I think we, we do, don't somehow catch that, you know. We keep thinking, no, minute, God is away up there, and all these millions are down here, and it's Hitler that chose to do it, and he did it against God's laws. So what's the situation? I mean, God doesn't. Yes, not one of those millions went fearfully into a lime pit or into a gas chamber, but God himself 
went in inside them. Why? Because he has to be responsible for all that he does. He has to be responsible for all that he has made. He, he would cease to be his own integrated self if he didn't do that. And so it's quite important that we grasp what he committed himself to when he made us of the same nature as himself. He then was committing himself to that. He was committing himself to dealing with everything that we did right up front and to face it with us and to face it as the person who was responsible for originating it. Now, I think I tried to bring that home to you, you know, last day by pointing out to you how a, a parent feels responsible for what their child does, especially if he ends up, of course, as one of those murderers who has shot down children in a school or something like that. But really, that's small compared with God's own situation, because the parent doesn't actually face the electric chair. The parent doesn't actually have to go to jail in spite of the fact that they might feel very much with the child, yet he doesn't actually have to do it. God himself does. And so he made us, he gave us existence, but he didn't give us an existence as little animals or little playthings that he would kind of play around with and then wipe off the chessboard and start over again with. He made us the same as himself. He gave us his very own life. And in order to do that, of course, we've said so often, you know, God, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. He actually made us in his own son. It's very hard for us to, to express the truth of that. We've, we've touched it a little, you remember, when we said, well, you have to be quite wise about who you, you receive into Christian core because we're much closer to each other than a, nor a normal organization. We, we live together, we eat together, we, we sleep in, this, in neighboring rooms and sometimes in the same room. We work together. Our finances are together. <laughs> Whatever a person does, they affect the whole atmosphere in the home. And so we have caught something of that. We can see a little how, in a way, uh, ordinary human families protect themselves because they actually don't normally take outsiders in unless they adopt a child or that kind of thing, or have visitors from time to time. But they don't actually bring someone inside their home. And we've seen how important it is to be sure you receive the ones that Jesus wants. But they're still not inside you. They're still not inside you. Even if they come here to, be, to live with us, they're not inside me. I, I am able to get into my bed at night and to think some thoughts that they don't know about. Now, what happens when they're inside you? I mean, it's not, you can't even liken it to a mum and a, a, a baby. You can't. Because sure, the mum feels the little baby kicking inside, but really doesn't know all the thought. In fact, the child, as far as we know, doesn't have any conscious thoughts. So the mother doesn't feel all the fear that the child feels or all the anxiety. Jesus does. <coughs> we were created inside Christ. And everything that we feel Everything that we think, he experiences. And so when God created us, he created us with a great generosity, a great grace. I mean, any of us could have said, look, it's enough if you give us this beautiful world, if you give us this universe, if you give us these skies to fly in and these roads to walk. That's wonderful. But above all that, he gave us his own inside, you know, his own insides he gave us. He brought us not just into his own home, he brought us into himself. And I don't know, again, if you've really thought through the 
incredibility of the fact that virtually the same millisecond that God conceived of his only begotten son, he also in that same millisecond conceived of his only begotten son as being the great human being in which then God created all of us. In other words, we were not an afterthought. We were not something that God decided later on. We are an integral part of what God himself and his son is. And that is startling, you know. I always thought of it, no, you know, there was God, and then he had his son some, some way back in infinity or eternity, and the Holy Spirit. And then at some point later on, he thought of us. So in that way, I felt, you know, well, we're important to God, but really we're something that he, outside, we're something outside himself. But you can see it isn't so. That we were adopted as his sons from the very beginning, as his children. And that we were created inside himself. The first moment he had the opportunity to create us in Jesus, he created us. So that is it. You would almost say, you know, it's... I mean, uh, you'd feel... You'd feel you were insulting, of course, God, and you were being unjustifiably independent. But you almost feel like saying, it wasn't necessary. You know, it, it wasn't. It wasn't necessary. But see, God knows it was necessary. Because he wants children who are close to him. He wants others like himself and his son. He does not want uh, little second-rate citizens that will somehow be let into heaven by the back door and will kind of play around the edges. God himself has made us an integral part of himself and of his own son. But that's only the beginning of it. God wasn't caught out. The, the same way as even, even we in our little human mental abilities are not caught out. A little dog, you know it can obey you or it need not obey you. But a human being is the same. You know that a human being with a free will, they may do what you want to do them to do or they may not do what you want them to do. So even we with our limited abilities, we can foresee. We can actually go further than that because sometimes we can say, I'll tell you what that guy will do. As soon as he gets hold of that car, he'll take himself into a wall. Or we can foresee what other people will almost certainly do. That's the whole basis actually of advertising in a way. It's the ability to foresee and anticipate what people will do when they see a certain picture on a magazine. In fact, you could say the whole basis of our manufacturing process is foreseeing what people will want to use, what they will need. So even we human beings can do that. Obviously, God, with his infinite mind, saw the whole thing in a second. You know, he, does, he doesn't need... Anyway, we know ourselves that time is simply a gracious creation of his. It's a temporary arrangement so that we, with our slow little minds, could follow out what he sees in a second. Even we, with our computers, have started to make fun of our own minds and the slow motion in which they move. But God himself is infinite. And in a millisecond, he saw the whole thing. Yes, he saw Marty Paylor's great-great-great-great-great-grandfather and then his great great and he saw and he saw what Marty Paylor would do today, and he saw the bumper that you bumped into. He saw everything. He saw everything in a millisecond. Why? Because God knows the whole potential of everybody. And yet the miracle is that inside all that foreknowledge and all that understanding, he did make us with a free will. It's remarkable.
And of course, we have real trouble with that because we think, oh, if I had the making of somebody, free will, yeah, but I'd then act and I'd make them do what I wanted them to do if I had the power. But God didn't, and God doesn't because he's more committed to others who love him and others whom he can love freely than he is to having everything go his way. And so he foresaw all that our lives would do. He foresaw all that we would do, except that that was all to take place. It could only take place in one place, the place where he had put us, in Jesus. So could you look at your only begotten son and infect him with AIDS? But that's, it, it's in those terms that you have to begin to see God's commitment to making us in his son and yet giving us free will and therefore allowing us to do whatever we wanted. And you know I've likened it rather pathetically, really, to little vermin inside the body, you know, eating away at the appendix, eating away at the arteries, the blood vessels, I suppose a cancer maybe, except that it seems to be a living thing, except there are millions of those. Some of them are Hitler's, some of them are Stalin's. Some of them are cleverer and more deceptive than that. But they're all eating away at each other and eating away because every time they eat each other, they eat the person who is in that, them, and that is Jesus. So they are actually eating away Jesus. And the Father saw that and saw it all in a millisecond. And that is the agony of Calvary. And he committed himself to that and was willing for that. And that's grace that is beyond anything you could imagine. But then he went beyond that because his own son was human, but he was also divine. So even as his own son was eaten apart and had to be destroyed so that we all could be ended, his own son himself obeyed perfectly and was in love and trust with his father, and he himself, his divine side, had victory over the destruction that took place in his humanity, and his divine side rose up. God at that moment when he could have let the human side be destroyed, God lifted the human side back into Jesus to give us the chance that we now have. And if you say, you mean started it all over again? Yeah, For started it all over again, brought us into his son and raised us up with him except that the life that he had foreseen us live, with all its mistakes, with all its disobediences, with all the confusion and the chaos that it created when we would take the wrong screw and screw it in and break the thread, and we would take money and spend it the wrong way, or we would speak a word to someone that cut them to the heart, Christ bore all those things, and God reconciled all those things to himself, bore them and accepted them, and then laid out a life for us that had all those things corrected. In other words, God foresaw the whole life that we would live. So a bit like sending a son out along a path strewn with trees that had fallen across it, with rivers that had burst over it, with pieces of the roadway that had fallen away. And his son went along <coughs> and lifted every tree out of the way, all the roadway, and then he left the appearance of the tree there 
So he left a balsa wood tree lying across the road. He left what appeared to be a hole in the road, so that as we came along, if we obeyed him and we put our hand to the tree, it was balsa wood, and the difficulty was lifted out of the way, so that we came along to the water and we were able to wade through it easily. And so we have a charmed way where the road has been made smooth and all the crooked things have been made straight. So God lived that whole thing in his son in a millisecond so that we then would have this opportunity to walk a life that's spread before us out of which all the dangers have been taken. There is the appearance of danger so that we exercise our faith in God but all the dangers have been removed. All the problems have been solved. All the sicknesses have been born. All the challenges have been met by <coughs> Jesus. And all we have to do, actually, is walk in the good works that have been prepared beforehand. Because every work has been prepared carefully beforehand by Jesus. So that we just walk in the work. We don't actually do the work. We walk in the work. That's the kind of grace. That's part of the riches of God's grace that he has lavished upon us and is lavishing upon us now at this very moment. So it's unbelievable. You know? It's just unbelievable. And yet that is how gracious and how generous he is. And of course, you can see a lot of this of our silliness. You know, I wonder, will God forgive me? Will he forgive you? <gasps> the dear Father has already borne all that and not only forgiven, but has provided an easy way forward for us. Uh, you can see, too, why it is such a shame. It is such a shame for us to get up any morning in depression. It is dreadful for us to spend a second in anxiety. It is a crying shame <coughs> that we do anything but laugh and rejoice all day because the Father has provided the whole thing for us. Let us pray. Dear Father, we thank you for the riches of your grace which you have lavished upon us. We thank you, Lord, for the abundant, generous gifts of energy and the freedom and liberty and joy that you shower upon us every second. And we thank you, O Lamb of Calvary. We thank you, O blessed Savior, for bearing all of the darkness for us so that <coughs> we could walk in constant light, for bearing all the death for us so that we could walk in daily life. Lord, we thank you. Thank you, Lord.